GMO discussion two months ago, and they didn't show up. In fact, the last GMO discussion we had on May 21st, right here in this facility, on Thursday, the 21st of 6.30, seven people showed up. And then, oh, well, you know, I sent it out to my regular contact list, put all our flyers, and um, seven people showed up. So now we have knowledge, but now you are aware. <coughs>
Dear Heavenly Father, um, Mahalo to you. Uh, it is with humility that we come before you, asking for your grace and your love to show us with your peace as we come here tonight. Thank you for bringing all these people here together from wherever they came safely. Uh, I ask that you guide us with enlightenment throughout the night, um, be able to open our minds so that we can listen constructively, um, and then be able to take our knowledge that we learned here tonight to uh, decide how we want to deal with it later on in the future when we wake up tomorrow. Um, but we just want to really thank you for this opportunity to get together and to share, share our thoughts, ask some questions, uh, spend a little quality time together. Um, at the end of the night, I humbly ask you that you please return each and every one of these individuals here tonight back to their homes safely so that you can be together with their families and continue to move forward productively constructively and efficiently in their beautiful lives. Because we're all here on this beautiful earth together. And it is what we make of it. Our time is special. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so without further today, um, we have here from St. Jesse Hawaii, Mr. Mark Philipson. From Pioneer Hybrid, we have Dr. Steve Goldstein. <coughs> and then thirdly, we have Dr. Fred Kernak from Wisconsin, Hawaii. <laughs> Each of the presenter has about 15 to 20 minutes. You'll notice I gave it till 8 o'clock because sometimes we tend to interject and interrupt the presenter because we have a burning question. So I went out a little bit of time to go over, but if we can hold those burning questions, we can get through the presentation a little bit faster and get into the question and answer forum. So in order to get through the question and answer forum efficiently, we have index cards that we can pass out. And so if you have a question you would like to ask, um, if you could write the question down and then give it either to Chris, Chris or myself, and then we will present the questions and get them answered in the order that they were received. So just raise your hand when you're ready to have your cards picked up or um, if you uh, questions in the time that we have. So maybe now would be a good time to ask the presenters if at the end we could collect the cards and then uh, go through them for duplicity and relevance and uh, maybe email them to you at a later date and try to get them answered and then send to all the electronics. Did I just make sense or was I just babbling? <laughs> Chris, you got more cards? Yeah. If you would like your name recognized with a question, because you'd like to be, you know, express your freedom of speech kind of thing, uh, please uh, do so, and you're more than welcome to do so.
molecular biology, which means I've spent a lot of years studying how plants work, about plant genetics, and have really had a passion for this uh, throughout my career and throughout my life. I started gardening when I was in about third grade and had a 4-H project for the school garden. I've always liked working with plants. I like farming. And uh, I came to Hawaii in 1994 to the University of Hawaii. And I've been here ever since doing work in agriculture and plant biology. So um, aloha, welcome. It's great to see so many people here. Right. And I'm um, glad that we have a number of people here interested in what we're talking about. Aloha, my name is Fred Perlack. I head up the Center of Operations in Hawaii. I have a PhD in microbiology from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. I spent 20 years as a molecular biologist designing and, and making a lot of the genes that are in our plants now. I don't have a formal presentation, but I'm here to answer any questions you might have specific about the Santos operation or any of the molecular questions that you might have or concerns to try to help answer and provide you information. Again, thank you for being here and welcome. Uh, I just wanted to open this up. Uh, uh, there was a, a kind of old saying that uh, when you come into a forum like this, everyone takes their hats off and uh, you can either put your hat down and keep it closed or you can keep your hat open. So this is really an educational experience for everybody. I hope you for yourself. And I ask that you be open-minded. We're not here to convince or sway. We're here to uh, present the data. Uh, I see the scientists as well. I, uh, we don't do a lot of communication classes, so I went back to my basic uh, who, what, when, where, why. And I will kind of uh, guide you through that. About the why Hawaii? Just, and I'm going to go ahead and sit down. The, uh, why we're in Hawaii is why there's no winter here. We can plant uh, three crops a year, and uh, that is pretty advantageous to the development of our nurseries and the products that we're developing. If we were to do this uh, on mainland, like say uh, in Iowa, we would get one crop a year and it would take us 10 to 12 years to, to do the research that we could possibly do in three or four years. Uh, so this brings products to the marketplace uh, at, uh, at a quicker pace. Uh, there's no shortcuts in it, it just speeds up the process. Uh, the, other prop, the, the other issue is that on the political and economic stability, if we're to do this outside of the United States, outside the regulatory processes that are established here, uh, it, it would be uh, more cumbersome and also probably wouldn't uh, uh, meet the criteria that is demanded here in the United States. We would do our research here. Uh, similar to uh, tourism, the uh, resources for the agricultural land available, and the irrigation infrastructure that Talk a little bit 
Oh, excuse me. I'm that Roundup ready? Aloha, no. My name is Fono uh, Aloha. I got a couple of agendas that I need to get kind of straightened out. Uh, color my for my lateness. But, first of all, if this is an open public meeting, why don't you allow somebody to video? Right, right. Uh, what, is, what, is, what is this? Right. If you're going to be up and up, this is the community. Right? We have a lot of kapuna over here that cannot make it over here. Right. They like to know what's happening. This is how we can inform them of what's going on. Now, if you want to be up front, and you want to be straight with us, I think everything you're saying to us right now should be told to them too, correct? Yes, absolutely. I agree yes. with you. So, uh, can we have a vote on that? Yes. How many say it should be yes. video? Yes, video. Yes. Okay, now... Yeah, well, you know. And also, we want to entertain questions at the end. Um, but the question, but can it be video? We, we're this is. Is this going to be a kangaroo circus or what? Okay. I'm just saying. We have a lot of people who cannot make it here. You know that. Then we all lose out on the information. Yeah, but if if it's a company coming in too hard. Yes. Yeah. So the coordinator of this meeting, you guys are becoming to be interrupted and disrespectful. That's not being asked. No, but I, see, now because we're having an interruption like this, we cannot move on with the agenda and the presentation got interrupted. Who in the so hell the are you speaking here? The your... more we get interrupted, we will not be able to get to the question and answer, which I am dying to but get to. You get it right to. now. Okay, I gotta admit, I'm a little bit impatient, but now I'm gonna step in and say something because I'm starting to get irritated. Well, I'm saying that could I set up my camera? I'll shut up. I'm just saying a camera should be set up so this can get to the kapuna that cannot hear. Can I let me hyper report on my camera? Because we didn't ask questions. Mm. Now we are asking questions. I'm 
we want it documented. It's all that we are asking. How is it that I'm asking you to document is beyond my it's beyond my comprehension right now. It's a simple thing like putting on putting on a video, video. getting all this information into the document in documentation, and then and then not doing a question and answering, and then we can understand what is going on. Because doing a question and answering, there isn't a depth of understanding of it. No, it's called air yeah, into the air. Yeah. I think we're past that right now. So all I'm sorry. I'm humbly asking, may we please just video this? If you guys are open, if yeah, it came from you, not even from them. You speaking up. Who are you? Are you the voice or are they? So you're their spokesman. So you speaking only for them and not for all of us. That this is good for my children and for my being. How can you guys say that? My genealogy is not an answer. Would you please stop interrupting me? Because I cannot guarantee what you're going to do with your documentation. Show it to people. I have ethical responsibility. Oh. <laughs> you show it to everybody. The truth will speak. The truth will speak. Can we video? We, will, will you let them answer? Will they let, let them answer? Video? Let them answer. Let them answer, not you. Can we video? May we please video? Why? May we ask why? I just wanted to get that this I out. I disagree. My mobile house is from here. Right. You want to check me out? Go to the site of Oahu. Enter me out here. That is my grandfather's brother.
Our and taking advantage of us. And you, agency, are coming in and saying, oh, we have to accept this. My position is such that I come into a community and I try to provide education and information. That is my agenda, that is my intent, and that is my purpose. And I feel I am delivering that tonight. Information. Then how is this going to get to a casino? Again, how can our kupuna get to this information? Again, can I hear from them? Can we video? No. And may I ask why, sir? From you. Why? Like I said, I have a lot of. I have. No, no. How is that going to be getting this information that you're giving now? Not on the record. Not on the record. I'm saying, what about my tutu who can't make it here? What about her? What is? Who are you working with? Let me tell you how. May I ask? Who's paying your pocket? Sunshine law here that they're not going to buy by. It, I don't understand why you're going to say you're going to listen to us and already you said no. I'm not going to listen to you. you we're not going to honor your request for a simple video. Even for you folks that's here, the company or the state the Department of Health to pull out your own video and video. Yeah. Can I ask a question? So I'm, I'm not from the airplane. If they didn't allow a video, would it appease you guys and then we yes, just move on? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That's, 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 that's a deal. That's a deal. Okay. 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 I'm, I'm, I have all respect, but you are interrupting people. So I know there's a lot of stuff that's happened, but I'm actually not a bad white person. I'm here to learn and try to understand <laughs> what's going on. So you can go to the website. There's already shook his head. No. <laughs> Well, this is the main guy over here, here, Dr. Fred. Yeah, so I'd like to get this moved on too. We're out of time. There is no law stopping video, so let's set up a video camera. Let's set up a video, yeah. And just let's roll. And if they want to leave, we videotape them leaving because the video is. Well, I love it. Should have been here with video camera. You know why? You know why? Because you know we will start filing suits. Is that a law? You should start guys. There's no law against video. Everyone videos everything. And you are the evidence. And guys. Are we evidence? Are we? Do we? Do we want to end the evening then? 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 Do we want to end the ev
No, it's not. And this is not a protest. How many times do I got to say You're that? asking me to go to the Capitol to do protest? You guys have, have had two protests yeah. in the last month. Yes, two. <laughs> Maybe more. I don't know. There was only two that was poorly. Why are we protesting? Okay. Why are we protesting? Okay. Do we really because need to that we had here. that meeting two months ago? The agenda is here. Yes, they're here. We want to hear them all. I feel you, babe. Because I learned a lot of this stuff recently, too. In fact, for years I've been reading up and I'm learning about the bad, about. I don't know. I don't know. accurate if there's no microphone. That's right. Oh, really? Right, okay, then let's go. Hurry right. up. Go. 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 Talk. Well, there shouldn't be a problem because you're going to say, whatever you're going to say is going to promote yourself, So you should, unless you're lying. So, that, I don't think so. So, there shouldn't be any problem with you speaking and someone recording it, right? Because you're doing it appropriately, so we're getting an appropriate just talk, recording. Yeah. Go ahead, Let's talk. just go. Go, go, shoot. Give it, give it. We ask that you respect As we have rest as well for, of you. Give us the sales pitch. Go ahead, go. We'll take notes. We will write down our questions. Thank you. 
all types of ag, and we want to see all types of ag thrive here in Hawaii. We care about sustainable ag. Everybody in ag cares about sustainable ag, cares about the lineup. It's important to use sustainable ag practices, and we do on our farms. Here you see an example of, uh, on the left, buckwheat, and on the right, sunhap. Those are two cover crops that we're working with for soil conservation purposes. You see here with the uh, buckwheat, there's actually a bee. That's a bee-friendly practice to plant buckwheat as a cover crop. It's a good host for bees for gathering pollen and nectar. We've been in Hawaii since 1968. And Pioneer does both the biotech or genetically engineered and traditional crops. If you look at one of our seed catalogs, we sell both types of seeds. We offer both biotech and the traditional. About 80% of our work is with corn. You also see in the middle soybean and on the right sunflower. We work with those three crops and a little bit of work with sorghum here in the state of Hawaii. Now, GMOs, Genetic engineering, the term that I usually use in talking about this is biotech or GE, genetic engineering. Genetically modified organisms or GMOs is the, the term we usually hear in print in uh, opposition to this technology. But really, in terms of more of a scientific way of looking at it, and I will try to present some science but make it understandable. You know, humans have been genetically modifying organisms for thousands of years. The, the early agriculturalists were women. They may have seen some rice plants over here that looked a lot healthier than all the other rice plants. So you save that <coughs> for the next year to plant. And that is how humans have been modifying crops literally for thousands of years by selecting the best seeds, the best animals, um, so that they pass their genes on to their offspring. It's the principle of, of breeding, that you want genes to be passed on to the next generation, and it's a principle of breeding. So with plant breeding, what is our goal? Our goal is really to improve yield and quality. Biotechnology, or genetic engineering, is a tool. It's one of the methods that we use, and it's a tool. On the left, you see Teosente. That's what ancient maize or corn looked like. On the right is what the type of corn looks like today that we see. In between that, there was a lot of genetic modification long before we had genetic engineering, just a lot of plant breeding work to genetically modify crops. Biotechnology can involve a number of concepts. It could be DNA fingerprinting, which may be used to determine uh, what is the uh, particular plant material or the background. It may be used for mapping a genome, just like we've mapped the human genome, plant genomes have been mapped. And then another example is genetic engineering. It may be used to study genes and plant genetics. It may be used to add a gene or maybe to remove a gene. So with GMO, this is a term that in our work refers to genetic engineering that we're using tools of biotechnology, and as I said, we may be adding or removing a gene. So in the top part of the slide, genetic engineering is used maybe to insert a gene or turn off a gene. And here's an example. You see the uh, oil uh, in, a, in a picture. We're doing work to remove a gene to make a healthier soybean oil. That is a type of genetic engineering. It's to remove the trans fats to make it a healthier oil for cooking and using in many of the products like crackers uh, and baked goods. Um, on the right, you see examples of insects. We put genes into plants to give them insect resistance. And then at the bottom, I show an example of doing the sort of DNA fingerprinting, for example, to look at and understand the papaya genome. Now, Mark talked a little bit about putting genes into plants. This slide shows very briefly how we do that. We take a gene, a piece of DNA. We introduce it into cells, like what's in the middle there slide. Those are some sugarcane cells from some work that I had done uh, many years ago. And on the right, some sugarcane plants that are being grown up to determine is 
fed cane in those plants, in that plant material. So that's what the process looks like. There's another method using a bacterium, a naturally occurring bacterium. As part of what agrobacterium does, it puts a piece of DNA into a plant cell. This is a natural mechanism that occurs with that bacterium. We make use of the fact that the bacterium puts genes into plant cells. So those are the two types of methods that we use to do genetic engineering. And the definition that I give of genetic engineering is we're introducing a gene into a plant or animal, but we're using lab methods. So I showed you those two methods. Those we we've done in the laboratory setting. The gene may be from the same organism, like Mark mentioned. We do some work with drought tolerance. It may be a gene from corn moving into corn or another grass species. But that gene could come from a plant. It could come from a virus. We have papaya green spot virus resistant papayas here in Hawaii that have resistance to papaya ring spot. That was created taking a piece of a viral gene to do that work. Uh, bacterial genes may be inserted. The uh, organic farmers use DT, Bacillus thuringiensis, to control insects. We've taken a gene from that same bacteria used by organic farmers and introduced that. Uh, in the end, you get a result or a characteristic or quality that wasn't found in that organism before. So this schematic shows conventional plant breeding and then comparing that to plant biotechnology. So we have our gene, our piece of DNA in the middle, and then we may make a cross, and I'll show you that in the slide what we mean, a pollination, to end up with the gene we're interested in, but many other genes are introduced as well. When you do traditional plant breeding, you're moving many genes when you cross-pollinate. When we do plant biotechnology work, we take this single desired gene, that piece of DNA, put that one gene into the varieties that we're working with. So at our research centers and in our plant breeding work, we've been here since 1968. We're developing new lines of corn, new soybean varieties, and sunflower hybrids. So what do we do when we're doing our plant breeding work? We're taking the pollen from one plant, introducing it to the silk of another plant. Oftentimes, that's a hand pollination that we're doing. A lot of this is work by hand. With soybean, that's the flower on the right. It's a lot of handy, small work using tweezers to do that pollination. We do a lot of work as hands-on plant breeding work. And when we do the genetic engineering work, the plant on the left may have a gene introduced by plant breeding or by genetic engineering, but we handle it in our plant breeding program in a very similar way whether it was from genetic engineering or whether it was from uh, an existing gene that's already in corn, let's say for drought tolerance, we would hand it or handle it in a similar manner. So here you see the <coughs> pollination step, taking pollen from the male, pollinating the silk of the female. Now when we look at adoption of biotech crops, it's largely farmers that are planting these crops in the U.S. and around the world, and farmers in the U.S. have rapidly adopted this technology. Um, the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture Economic Research Service, does track this data every year. This year, the report for July 2012, about 93% of soybeans that are being grown in the U.S. this year, 94% of corn, I'm sorry, 94% of cotton, 88% of corn, and the last statistic I could find for papaya was in 20, uh, 2010, about 68% were genetically engineered biotech crops. And you see here the trend over the years, starting in 1997, collecting data, you see that for corn, soybean, and cotton, farmers in the U.S have adopted this technology rapidly and are planting this amount, these percentages of these crops. So one thing I think you'll, you'll see in this is there are benefits to a farmer that plants these crops. And it's the farmer determines what crops are they going to plant, which year, with which characteristics. 
But farmers are adopting these crops. Why, when, why, why are they? These are from a survey of farmers themselves that USDA had conducted on adoption. 60 to 80 percent said to increase yields through improved pest control. The second most cited aim, save management time and make other practices easier. 15 to 26 percent responded in that manner. A third reason, decrease pesticide costs. And I took a look at some data. This is a peer-reviewed article. It means other scientists have reviewed and contributed data for this article. It appeared in Nature Biotechnology in April 2010. It shows that the decreased amount of insecticides um, from using biotech crops, there is a decreased amount of insecticide use or decreased number of insecticide applications in both. Those reductions range from 14 to 75% in terms of the amount of the pesticide active ingredient and 14 to 70% fewer applications in the study that were evaluated. None of the study results indicated an increase in insecticide use for those farmers that adopted the GM insecticide. <coughs> so this is the benefit where we're seeing a reduction, and again, if anybody wants the citation, I do have the paper here. We use um, data that can be tracked to articles that are published in scientific journals. In 2011, when we looked at biotech crops grown internationally, not just in the United States, in 2011, 16.7 million farmers in 29 countries planted 395 million acres of biotech crops. This is a 94-fold increase. Uh, if you'd like, I can provide you the, the citation. If you'd like. Um, this is a ISAAA International Acquisition Act. ISAAA is the organization's acronym. They do these um, studies every year for international biotech crop statistics. What are some of the biotech crops that are in the marketplace? I hear people say, oh, you know those seedless yellow watermelon? Oh, you know, those are genetically engineered. They are not. That's a naturally occurring mutation. Oh, those yellow tomato tomatoes, I think they were genetically engineered. No, those are naturally occurring mutations. The genetically engineered crop that have commercial approval that you'll find is canola, corn, cotton, papaya. There have been some approvals for potato. Soybean, yellow squash, sugar beets, rice, and tomato. Uh, these are also approved in other nations, not just in the U.S. Okay, you back up. You back up for a Thank you. 
double food production and increase production by about 70% by 2050 to adequately feed this growing population. Is agriculture biotechnology the only way to do this? No, it is a tool. It is a tool that can be used in crop improvement and one of the ways that we can help feed what we expect to be an expanded global population. So what do we see in yield and production? Because we are, our goal is to increase yield through different methods, different ways. When Pioneer Hybrid was founded in the 1920s, it was founded on the principle of developing corn hybrids. So you see here at the beginning of the graph, we go from open pollinated to doing some types of hybrid crosses. So this is technology. When hybrids were first introduced, if you looked at the comments that people made in that era, at that time, and you didn't know what technology they were talking about, you would think they were talking about biotechnology and genetic engineering today. It says things like this will be a disaster for farmers. This is a terrible thing for farmers. Farmers should not plant those crops. You should not spend money on that. It's a bad thing. And over the years, farmers saw that hybridization, those tools of plant breeding, those crops gave higher yields, and the technology was rapidly adopted over time when farmers saw the benefit in their production. And you see here with biotech being introduced uh, around 1996 commercially, where we started seeing trade um, with biotech. Again, we, we see increasing yields <laughs> over time. But what do we see worldwide? This is data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture on corn yield, as was the previous slide. U.S. Department of Agriculture data uh, that they have provided. You see that in the U.S., the corn <coughs> line that goes the highest, we have had substantial increases in yields of corn. However, in other parts of the world, in parts of Asia, Africa, very low yields compared to what the potential is. So the work that we're doing is tapping into using the technologies of plant breeding, whether it's genetic engineering technology, <laughs> genetic engineering combined with plant breeding, to increase yields in other parts of the world, as well as continuing to do that in the US. So when we talk about increasing yield, what do we mean as plant breeders and people that work with plant genetics? Well, really, you increase yield through things like better resistance to disease, better insect and pest resistance, stronger stalks. Can you imagine if you were a farmer and you grew your crop and you're one week away from harvest and a big wind and hailstorm comes and all your sunflowers blow over or all your corn blows over? It's a significant economic loss to a farmer. That's what we mean by strong stalks as well as survival and challenging environments. I'll come back to this one. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, uh, uh, survival and challenging environments. Mark gave an example of drought tolerance. I'll uh, give you another example. In plant breeding here in Hawaii, we've done work with biotech traits or characteristics like insect resistance. So I mentioned the BT gene coming from the soil bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis. Organic farmers use that whole organism, that whole bacterium. Uh, in our work, we've taken a specific gene from that bacterium for insect resistance. And they can be the uh, resistance is to very specific insects. It binds to receptors in the gut of the insect. Mammals. Uh, so that's us, humans, other organisms do not have the mechanism for the binding of that particular protein. It does not impact other organisms. It's very specifically targeted to the specific insects that it is targeted for and uh, also for protection of roots. So that is an example of one of these genetically engineered characteristics for insect resistance. Uh, I thought I'd just mention a little bit about work we do here that has impact in other parts of the world. We've been uh, pioneers in the Philippines since 2011.
2011, I mean, I'm sorry, for 35 years in 2011. On Kauai, we did some work to develop the parents to make the corn hybrids that are grown in the Philippines. Again, environmental conditions, the breeding for <laughs> um, so the very environment and things like elevation, rainfall. So we do breeding for specific locations and uh, environmental conditions. But again, insect resistance is important, both white and yellow corn. We also focus on traits that have to do with quality. Let's say higher protein when an animal eats the animal feed converts more of that into protein and lean meat. I mentioned the healthier soybean oil as an example, with no trans fats, and also corn hybrids with more efficient conversion to ethanol. These are just an example of what we mean when we talk about quality. We're also doing work to improve productivity in terms of challenges that are related to more sustainable agriculture practices. So corn with better nitrogen use efficiency, uh, working with plant breeding programs, to help farmers increase yields with the same amount of nitrogen, or hybrids 